Good morning. That was, that's a hard act to follow. That song got me pumped up. Um, my name is Sean, uh, and I am on the teaching team here at Watershed. And I've actually been coming to Watershed since in second year of existence, uh, since before kids or marriage. In however many years it's been, I've been a lot of iterations of myself, the fresh out of college stars in my eyes self, my dating self, my public servant self that saw systemic injustice play out at institutional levels, my married self, my out of work but making it work self, my motherhood self, my middle years self, Watershed has seen me through so many iterations, but I have also lived through many different watershed identities too. We didn't always look like this, and we didn't always believe as we do now. Watershed isn't the church I used to know. But I'm coming to understand that if in my faith journey, my church hasn't changed or my worldview has stayed the same, then I'm not really growing spiritually. It would be presumptuous to think that I learned everything I need to know about God, or about being a good human, or about living in community long ago. And I don't say that to diminish my Catholic roots or the religious foundation my faith has been built on. I say it as a reminder that the church isn't a static thing or at least I don't think it should be. One universal truth I've always felt about the church is that it isn't the brick and mortar building or the institution or the organization. I think the church is the people. Before we landed here in this physical space, watershed touched ground in at least four or five different locations. I have honestly lost count. I have volunteered with five different greenhouse pastors, if my memory serves. And I realize those details might paint a narrative of a place that's unstable, but I actually think the opposite is true. Watershed has been a place of change. That I cannot deny. But those changes, or at least in my perspective, have been ones of reckoning and growth. I suspect, in many ways, Watershed will always be the church I used to know, as it continues to evolve over time. But Watershed will also be the people I used to know from this space, some who are no longer here, but whom I still dearly love. Why am I talking about people? The notion of church as people is important, and I want to stay in this space for this morning for a minute. What if we widened our understanding of church as people? What if we really undertook the biblical imperative of loving the stranger and applied stranger not just to the literal foreigner, but also the person we don't know well? If we encompass the stranger into the people, then the church effectively becomes everyone. It becomes all community. Jeffrey Stout, in his book, Democracy and Tradition, writes, democracy takes for granted that reasonable people will differ in their conception of piety, in their grounds for hope, and in their ultimate concerns, and in their speculations about salvation. Yet it holds that people who differ on such matters can still exchange reasons with one another, and do both of these things without compromising their integrity. So then, how do we, Watershed, lean into the space where democracy with integrity, where church with grace isn't just possible, it's a lived reality? I've often heard America described as a melting pot and um, as a Latin American woman, that metaphor troubles me deeply. The verb melt suggests an amalgamation. It suggests to me assimilation, where diverse cultures adapt to resemble a dominant culture. Perhaps you've heard of the alternative image of a salad, where different ingredients come to make a unique entree. 
In a salad, you can see the tomatoes, the croutons, the cucumbers, or whatever, you know, people's salads, are, that's a personal thing, so whatever would be in your personal salad, right, you could see the individual pieces. In a melting pot, the individual ingredients are hard to discern. The salad metaphor works, but I like Ibu Patel, who is a leader in interfaith work in America, his image of a potluck dinner instead. For a potluck is an invitation to everyone, and it invites everyone to bring something, to contribute to the collective. Patel says potlucks are civic spaces that both embody and celebrate pluralism. They rely on the contributions of a diverse community. If people don't bring an offering, the potluck doesn't exist, and if everybody brings the same thing, the potluck is boring. By nature, a potluck represents the diversity that's on the table. Potlucks are the epitome of shared hospitality, of community. It seems we need more potlucks, shared meals, civic engagement. Instead, we have the equivalent of a high school cafeteria room at lunchtime, tables of like-minded people with an attitude that suggests to the outsider, you can't sit with us. Consider for a moment who isn't invited at your table. Consider for a moment what might happen if you invited the other to the table. And I need to step back and acknowledge here that in this room, a lot of us have historically been the other, right? Brown, black, indigenous bodies, LGBTQIA plus identities. This auditorium is a wonderful tapestry of others. I'm using a different um, orientation. So what I mean in the context of today's dialogue, when I say the other, I'm referencing the person whose beliefs don't match your own, whose political leanings maybe confuse or anger you. Binary perspectives are too difficult, in my opinion. They're too limiting. Binary perspectives leave out humanity. They flatten people in untrue and hurtful ways. How do we see the human across from us apart from the institution or political party they belong to? How do we see the human as more than their bumper sticker ideology? Actor, writer, educator Bell Hooks puts it this way, how do we hold people accountable for wrongdoing and yet at the same time remain in touch with their humanity enough to believe in their capacity to be transformed? That feels like radical love to me. And I will be honest, over the course of these past few years, watching the very clear racism, clear oppression of marginalized people have made radical love a very hard feat for me. I have felt downright rage at the remarkable disdain shown to people who look like me, at the violence targeted at black, brown, transgender, gender fluid bodies. But rage, I've learned, is not absent of love. In fact, I don't think rage exists without love. One must care greatly in order to be aggrieved enough to use the word rage. And I think rage is an appropriate response to trauma. And while we, especially black and brown bodies, have been conditioned to think of rage as a bad thing, rage serves a purpose. It's part of the spectrum of love. In order to love the opponent, we must have safe spaces to release our rage. Spaces where we can embody our rage safely. Spaces where we can ask, what is my rage telling me? Audre Lorde says this, to listen to its rhythms. Learn within it. Move beyond the manner of presentation to the substance. Tap that anger as an important source of empowerment. To love the opponent does not ask you to evaporate the pain or the anger. I'm not suggesting that making room at the table means we must make ourselves small or silence our emotions. But I do want to gently suggest that I think that there is a cadence that perhaps we must embrace. We must step away from rage. 
We must work together. Valerie Carr wrote a book called See No Stranger, and a lot of the ideas that I'm sharing with you today come from that book, and she talks about that rhythm of anger and the purpose that it serves. If anger is included in the spectrum of love, then it cannot be necessarily the opposite of love. But then, what is? I think indifference is the opposite of love. Holocaust survivor Eli Wiesel has famously said that. But part of the quote that often gets left out is this. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. And the whole quote goes like this. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. Apathy and indifference show a total lack of concern for the other. So I'm not asking you to feel empathy for the opponent, for the oppressor, or for the person who refuses to see your humanity. Carr assures us that we do not need to feel anything for our opponent at all in order to practice love. That seems antithetical, right? That, that we don't have to feel anything in order to love someone. What love does ask us to do is to see the other's humanity, even when they refuse to see yours. I think that's hard. I live in spaces, I have close friends, family that I love, who I don't think fully see my humanity. And so this practice of being at the table with them isn't just theoretical, it's a real lived thing. What replaces hate and anger then? Maybe curiosity? Maybe wonder? To meet people with curiosity, with wonder, allows us to coexist in the world without the trappings of hate. When we listen, really listen with the intent to learn, through the holy, holy lens of curiosity, of seeking to understand, we take up the good labor of love. Listening for me has become a third way, a way to engage meaningfully with people I don't understand but love deeply, with people I love but I want to just shake, maybe with people that I don't know well and don't want to love at all, the one I think I don't need to know at all. But that person's in my life anyway. I want us to maybe just take a minute. Who are those people? The coworker? The boss? The kid's teacher? The spouse's coworker? The neighbor? Here's the thing this is holy work. And this labor of love, it doesn't always feel good. Deep listening, Carr says, is an act of surrender. We risk being changed by what we hear. The rhetoric I see play out on social media is not the act of deep listening. We do not check our preconceived notions at the door. We do not listen with curiosity, but rather we listen and read to find fault, to find the place where we can assert ourselves to say, ah, but that's where you're wrong. Or we read and listen to find our own worldviews affirmed, to say, yes, Exactly, you get it. The only person that I know that can tow this line well is Cedric on, on, on online spaces. The third way is not about agreement or compromise. It's about understanding what matters to the other person and sometimes placing what matters to you to the side just for a little bit. Love doesn't require agreement at all times. I mean, like, if that did, there would be no romantic unions, right? If love required, <laughs> just, I'm just saying, yes, we get it, right? So loving the neighbor, loving the opponent, the other, is, it's bridge-building work that leans on agape love. 
that leans on, I don't like you, but I love you. And I sometimes wonder if we have mixed up this notion of radical love for radical religion. If I ever feel myself getting slightly indignant or feeling self-righteous about something, a little red flag goes up in my conscience. To bring myself back to center, to clear the fog or the rage, I go back to praxis. What does the practice of my faith look like? What does the practice of loving my neighbor look like? Making smaller tables isn't good practice. It's not good faith or good love. And yet I think that that's what we've collectively done these past few years. And for good reason, perhaps, right? We shuttered ourselves indoors. We tightened our circles out of precaution and safety in a gesture truly of concern for community and out of an abundance of caution during a global pandemic that is still here in our midst. It's very present. Two years ago, that retreat was the right thing to do, I feel. But I also feel it came with unintended consequences. The art of hospitality, the good old-fashioned potluck, seems to be a relic of the past. Our circles have remained small, perhaps even closed off. Hospitality is a tool of love and tolerance. Henry Nouwen, if anybody's keeping track, yes, I mention him every time I'm up here. Henry Nouwen positions hospitality as space created intentionally free. And I'm quoting him now. These are not my wise words. They're his. A space where the stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place. It is not to pull people over to our side, but to offer freedom not disturbed by dividing lines. It is not a method of making our God or our way the criteria for success or happiness, but the opening of an opportunity to others to find their guide and find their way. The paradox of hospitality is it wants to create emptiness, not a fearful emptiness, but a friendly emptiness where strangers can enter and discover themselves as created free free to sing their own songs, speak their own languages, dance their own dances, free also to leave and follow their own vocations. Free to go their own way, in other words. Free to find another church. Hospitality is, or should be, the praxis of our beliefs. It is the doing. It is the action that carries weight that I believe plants the seeds of change. Our Facebook posts, our shouting at each other, our posture of my truth is better than yours, isn't the type of action that meets the other in a spirit of grace, curiosity, and love. Practice is important to faith. In the book of James, we know that faith without deeds is dead. And I'm going to kind of slide around here. But James um, 2.14 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? And then later in 17, in the same way, faith itself is not accompanied, that is not accompanied by action is dead. Then 24, you see that a person is considered righteous, but what they do and not by faith alone. And then again in 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. I think James was maybe trying to tell us something. It's a lot of repetition. I teach uh, English composition courses at a university, and if, if James were my student, I'd be like, we get it. You just say it once or twice, right? But clearly, maybe we don't get it. And James is telling us over and over and over again for good reason. What is your faith in action? Your faith in action doesn't require you to divorce yourself from your feelings. Again, hospitality doesn't require agreement, 
It doesn't even require warm, fuzzy feelings, although I would agree that that would be nice. Truly, though, hospitality does not require I agree with the way someone parents, what their feelings on vaccines are, when they believe life starts in the womb, or what autonomy women should have over their bodies. And for the record, hospitality isn't just rooted in Christian theology. It's a principal value in all Abrahamic faiths, which includes Islam and Judaism, too. In fact, it's a value shared by many world religions. If we read the sacred texts of other world religions, we will see the tenet of hospitality propped up as a virtue, as a value. And while hospitality may not need agreement, it does require attention, presence. It requires a desire, a heart that is open an authenticity, and a vulnerability to be open to the other, a willingness to sit in spaces of tension and duality. And I get it. It may seem too much. The injustices pile up, and watching the news seems to confirm that only a slim few enjoy true freedom. Watching the news confirms the presence of senseless violence, of ignorance, and hate. It's too much. Mother Teresa said once, if I look at the mass, I will never act. If I look at the one, I will. So we start with the one. We start with the neighbor, the teacher, the family member, the coworker. Carr puts it this way, can you choose one person to start wondering about? Can you listen to the story they have to tell? If your fists tighten, or your heart beats fast, or shame races to your face, it's OK. Breathe through it. Trust that you can. Watershed isn't the church it once was. It was less affirming. It espoused really traditional values about what marriage looked like. It even went so far as to consider, I mean, I'm embarrassed reading this. It even went so far to consider living together before marriage a sin in its early days. I've watched it change. And my own beliefs have expanded with it. In this place, now and here, in this space of already but not yet become, Watershed is in the practice of building bridges, of making room at the table. You are always invited here, but know that this place is ever-changing, ever-growing. The work we do in this space together is one of presence, and it is work that will truly never be completed. In this kingdom of heaven on earth work, let our tables truly invite everyone. Today, in a show of that, we're going to take in communion. And it's not going to look the way we used to do it, but I promise we will get back to that one day. I do hope, though, that you will let this communion be a symbol of a potluck. Let it remind you that you are made for community to break bread and celebrate life together. Jesus invited his friends to the table, but let's not forget he knowingly invited his opponent to the table too. And scriptures don't give us much to go on in regards to Judas and his betrayal. We don't know the full story or what motivated him to act as he did. But Jesus invited the opponent. In a minute, some of our community members are going to come up and hand the elements of communion. And again, we're still doing this COVID style, so it's, it's like just a cup. And you'll go back and take it to your seat if you like. And they'll be, I think, up on either side. But also, feel free to just sit in this space. Because that's the beautiful thing about communion. You can come to the table as you are. You can come to the communion table filled with rage at the injustices around you, angry at the ways you've been excluded. You can come to the communion table feeling not good enough or afraid. You can come confused about where you stand with God and others. 
unsettled about your own identity, you are welcome to come as you are. And you're also just welcome to sit in this space. Do not feel pressure to opt into this practice. Take what you need today. But as you share in this expression of communion, I humbly ask that you reflect on who you invite to your own tables. Who can you make room for?